Good afternoon. I am Tanya Winters, the President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program titled Experts Answer Your Questions About COVID-19, Asthma, Allergies, and the Flu. We want to be sure that you get the answers to your questions. We welcome you to this 15th webinar in our series of special COVID webinars that address the unique issues related to the coronavirus. Over 40,000 people just like you have tuned in to view these special COVID webinars. And it is essential to the mission of Allergy and Asthma Network, which is to end the needless death and suffering due to allergies, asthma, and related conditions through our four mission areas of outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Today, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. First, Dr. Pervy Parikh is an adult and pediatric allergist and immunologist at Allergy and Asthma Associates of Murray Hill. She is currently on faculty as clinical assistant professor in both departments of medicine and pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. She is passionate about health policy and is, serves on the board of directors of the Advocacy Council of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She frequently travels to Washington, D.C. to influence policy, testify before the government, and advocate on behalf of her patients and the organizations that she desires to represent, like the United Nations Foundations and Allergy and Asthma Network. Dr. Parikh is a spokesperson for Allergy and Asthma Network and frequently makes appearances as a medical contributor on our behalf to NBC, Fox, CNN, Wall Street Journal, and CBS. She also has her own monthly column in US News and World Report. As a resident of New York City, Dr. Parikh has certainly been on the front lines of this viral outbreak and has unique perspectives about COVID-19 that she'll be sharing today. Secondly, Dr. Jackie agari Sabet is a board certified allergist, immunologist, and pediatrician, and is the director of telehealth for Allergy and Asthma Network. She is the founder of Family Allergy and Asthma Care, where she has been in private practice treating children and adults since 1994 in the Metro DC area. She served for 12 years as a medical contributor for NBC News in Washington, and has co-written multiple magazine, newspaper, and online media health articles. She has also been a principal investigator for the FAR Institute, conducting phase three and four clinical trials. She serves as clinical assistant professor at George Washington University School of Medicine, where she enjoys mentoring the next generation of doctors. Dr. Agar Sabet is the president of White Coat Resources, a health education consulting service that helps connect patients to therapy through innovative medical messaging and education programs. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for having us. So over the course of our time today, uh, this is the, the way that we're gonna spend our, the balance of the rest of our time. First, um, we'll look at the current state of COVID-19 as we always do, look at the numbers, look at the trends, talk about what the headlines are, and then we're gonna turn our focus solely to your questions. These are the most frequently asked questions that have come into the network over the course of the last six or seven months on asthma, allergies, flu, COVID, and more. So first, we're gonna start out with a poll. We'd like to always check in and see who is with us today. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the very first poll that says, which category best describes you? Are you a physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, school nurse, respiratory therapist, asthma educator, patient, or other? Go ahead and log your response now. We'll collect those responses and share in just one moment. We had well over 1,600 people register for today, so we'll give everybody just another moment to log in their response. And then we'll close the poll and share. So with about 80% of the respondents, let me share the results. Looks like we've got 
a number of physician and physician assistants, nurse practitioners on the line, as well as an overwhelming majority of nurses and school nurses, respiratory therapists, asthma educators and health educators, and about 7% patients or others. So thanks everybody for joining. We love to see that multidisciplinary um, team approach that is always represented in the audience of our webinars. So thank you for sharing that today. All right, so what is the current state of COVID-19 as we sit here on October 27th? I think we all are still shocked that, uh, you know, it's been over now seven months since we first started doing these webinars and getting together. And, and we always like to ground with this particular slide from Johns Hopkins University. Um, it's the COVID-19 dashboard where they have been tracking the global number of cases by country as well as the global death rates. And you can see here, that we are quickly escalating towards uh, 44 million global cases with over 8 million of those being in the US, approximately 8 million in India and about 5.5 million in Brazil. And then we also look at the global death toll now um, certainly exceeding 1.1 million overall with 225,000 uh, those deaths coming from the United States, 157,000 coming from Brazil, and then India in third there with 119,000. And so again, when you look at the populations of the countries that are, are most populated and most represented here, um, it, it's quite startling with US again having about 330 million people and quickly rising towards 9 million of those being infected uh, versus a country like Brazil where there's about 210 million people and 5.4 million people being infected. Um, so after looking at those global rates, we also like to take a look at the U.S. data and see how the U.S. data is trending. Again, the CDC data is a little bit lagging. Um, it looks at the case count over the last seven days per 100,000, and that's the different shadings that you see here. Um, the darker the shade, the more intense the cases are over the last seven days. And you can see that we are up over 60,000 new cases. Uh, in the last day. And we're hearing this, you know, consistently, there's over 35 states that are on the rise. And, um, and when we look at the headlines, we'll see that definitely the health systems and the death tolls are continuing to rise. Um, and, and there are growing concerns over um, new restrictions and quarantines that are coming into play. So as I said, we've got this rapid acceleration. The daily infection right now has exceeded 60,000 new cases a day. There have been 14 states that have set new records in COVID hospitalizations. Um, and we did have a bit of good news in that Gilead's remdesivir was the first drug to actually get FDA approval for treatment of COVID-19, of the coronavirus. Uh, so they, the FDA approved remdesivir to treat adults who are hospitalized with COVID-19, although the data is still not completely clear about the way in which it reduces the death toll. But the usual course of treatment with remdesivir is five days, during which time six vials of that drug are administered. And at the present time, it can really only be taken intravenously, although we have learned that Gilead is currently developing an inhaled version of this treatment product. So no vaccines approved yet, although we hear one is being submitted uh, by Pfizer in the next two weeks. And then this is the first approved treatment to come forth. We also have uh, in the news making headlines the Great Barrington Declaration, where again, there are very great concerns around the lockdown policies and the domino effect and how they are producing these devastating effects, both short term and long term on public health. And some of these include lower childhood vaccination rates, worsening cardiovascular disease outcomes, fewer early cancer screenings, deteriorating mental health. We know that, there, that all of these things could be leading to greater mortality in the years to come, especially those in the working class and younger members of society who are really carrying so much of this burden. And, and of course, we're all concerned about our, stu our students and keeping students in school, because we know that if students are not in school and learning, then certainly 
this is a grave injustice and, and again has that uh, unintended consequence for society. So we also have seen in the headlines that there may be approving a vaccine that is definitely that approval of a vaccine is an important first step and that may be manageable and doable as we approach the latter two months of 2020. But the question is, will we be able to deliver that vaccine into the community in a volume that uh, will help us to achieve that herd immunity? So that may not be as manageable. While we may get a vaccine approved, the actual delivery at the community-based level may be a bit more challenging. So as we look at the new cases by day, uh, uh, Sally and I were talking earlier about this slide, the fact that um, CDC is changing the way that they're reporting their data here, but this is a really important trend line to look at since late February. You see how we had that peak in late March, early April, and then the major peak of uh, exceeding over 60,000 cases in mid-July, and now we're seeing that second surge of over 60,000 new cases per day here in late October. So we knew the second wave would come. We weren't sure exactly when, but definitely I think here in the US, this chart demonstrates it most effectively. So on as far as today's webinar, we, we wanted to actually help you look for information from trusted sources as we answer these questions. We know that not all information on the internet is true and accurate and reliable. And so where we have been able to, we've actually added the logo of where the information that we're sharing came from. And we want you to be cautious that just because it's on the internet or just because it's in the news or in the headlines of your 6 p.m. news, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always validated and true. So look for that evidence-based information from those expert sources that are consistent in reporting on this very topic. So now we're gonna launch another one of our poll questions. What sources of health information are you most likely to trust? So I'm gonna launch that poll now and you can log your response. Is it your private healthcare provider? Is it the news and media? Is it government agencies? Health, hospital health and nonprofit websites or internet blogs. So choose the ones that you are most likely to trust, that you go to most frequently, and we'll see what the response of the group on the line is today. We'll leave this open for just another 15 or 20 seconds. I think this is gonna be a very interesting poll as I get to see a little bit of the sneak peek of responses. So just about five more seconds. Looks like we've got about three fourths of the people logging in their response. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So interestingly enough, we see that 14% are going to their private healthcare provider Surprisingly, only 1% are really relying on the news and the media, um, while about half are going to government agencies and a third going to hospital health and nonprofit websites, and then 1% internet blogs. So very interesting here because, you know, I think so many times people assume that um, the six o'clock news or 11 o'clock news, depending on where you are in the country, has the most accurate information. And yet, according to um, our audience, uh, you're definitely turning to other sources more consistently. All right, so next uh, we're gonna turn to your questions about COVID-19, asthma, allergies, and um, the, the flu and related conditions. And so next I'll turn it over to Dr. Purvi Parikh. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, that poll response is very interesting. Um, but I'm glad people are going to, you know, national agencies. Um, so we're going to be starting with, um, you know, questions about asthma themselves, because right now, as we know, is peak asthma time, especially fall. Uh, third week of September is known as asthma peak week. 
Um, and the biggest question I got, even since March, you know, are inhaled corticosteroids protective with COVID-19? Uh, and whether the use of ICS protects against COVID-19 is still unknown. But, you know, it, to dismiss this hypothesis as nonsense is very premature. And I agree with that because, you know, we know already that against other viruses that well-controlled asthmatics do far better than those who aren't taking their controller medications. Uh, and so I think even though we do need more studies for COVID-19 specifically, based on what we've seen from the flu and other coronaviruses, that it very much could be protective. And it's always better to have your asthma under control than not. Um, and then is budesonide inhalation protective against COVID-19? So again, this goes along uh, with the inhaled steroid uh, question. So at the present time, you know, the clinicians should be aware that there's no strong data to support, you know, the withdrawal of ICS. Uh, in patients who um, are currently well controlled on these drugs. In fact, we're encouraging people, please stay on your controller medications. Do not stop any medications, especially without speaking to your physician. Um, and then people with asthma and COPD who are stable um, while using ICS, again, should continue to use them. Uh, and if there is any uncertainty about the diagnosis, physicians should be more careful about initiating ICS or ICS and LABA um, without clear evidence of asthma. And similarly, um, there's no evidence to suggest that a change in the uh, advice for asthma patients um, to increase the dose of the ICS at the onset of an exacerbation. And, and I can you know, confirm this is true. I have uh, quite a few asthmatics, some of which did uh, contract COVID-19. And, you know, we didn't change any of their medications and most of them did very, very well. You know, they didn't have to go to the hospital or anything. And I really do think it's because they were all still on their control of medications, just as a personal aside. So I have severe asthma and my job takes me into schools and homes. How risky is this during COVID-19? So this is also a question that I get frequently. I'm sure Dr. Jackie does as well. So, you know, we do know that people with moderate to severe asthma may be at a higher risk of getting sick from COVID-19 because we know it affects the lungs. Um, but the person who would know best, you know, is your physician because not no two asthmatics are the same. It's best to sit down and discuss um, what your personal risk factors are and if you have other risk factors in addition to asthma that might make you higher risk. Um, we do know it affects your nose, throat, lungs, and entire respiratory tract, um, and could lead to pneumonia and other secondary infections. So it's definitely a concern, and more reason you should have that conversation with your physician. Um, is the use of rescue inhalers by young children in school a uh, higher risk with COVID-19? So again, uh, data is limited, like with everything in this pandemic. But we do know that, you know, aerosolized nebulizers might be at higher risk and are potentially infectious. So this is why we're recommending to limit nebulizer treatments at school. They, um, and each child should have their own MDI inhaler rather than sharing inhalers. And again, just to stress the point from previous webinars, you know, if someone is sick enough to need a nebulizer, they probably should not be in school, period. You know, so we should only reserve these nebulizer treatments for um, you know, absolutely necessary cases where they don't have their own inhaler. Um, have we found that asthmatics wearing a mask causes breathing issues? Um, what about children with asthma? So no, um, there is no um, data that it's not safe for asthmatics to wear a mask. Um, if anything, it's protective and people with chronic lung diseases such as those with cystic fibrosis have been wearing masks uh, far before the pandemic because it protects them from getting life-threatening infections. So uh, absolutely not. There is no data um, that would suggest this. And again, the data supports the opposite, that it's protective to yourself. Um, have, oh, sorry, same question. Sorry, <laughs> next slide. Okay, so next we will move on to questions about allergies, as many of the symptoms can be overlap, overlapping and similar. Um, will I be protected from seasonal allergies if I wear a mask? 
So yes, it can give some protection from larger particles, but again, if you don't wash your mask frequently, similarly to how we recommend, you know, washing your clothes when you come in from outside, you may actually be continuing to inhale allergens and other particles that were collecting on your mask throughout the day, as well as bacteria and germs. Dr. Preek? Oh, sorry, I had accidentally uh, muted myself. So That's how okay. can I tell uh, if I have COVID-19 or it is my allergies acting up? Um, this is a big question, especially in the spring when the pandemic first started. And now again in the fall, as allergy season is, has come back around with ragweed pollen, um, the, key, the biggest key differentiating factor um, is fever. Uh, so generally by fever, I mean a temperature over 100.4 or higher. This is unique to not only COVID-19, but also other viruses like flu um, and other uh, viruses that we see this time of year. Also, um, seasonal allergies don't have stomach symptoms. So you don't get diarrhea, nausea, upset stomach. And we don't really see that loss of taste and smell that we see with COVID-19 with seasonal allergies. Again, allergies are more likely to itch, so you'll get the itchy, watery eyes, whereas we don't see itching as much as a feature of COVID-19. Does having seasonal allergies increase my risk of getting COVID-19? So again, uh, we don't have enough scientific information at this time to know whether having seasonal allergies puts you at higher risk of contracting COVID-19 or having more severe symptoms. We do know that older adults and people who have severe underlying conditions like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and of course, chronic lung disease are at higher risk. So if you have allergies plus those other conditions, you are definitely higher risk. But from other viruses, we do know that there's a more a higher disposition in people who are allergic. Um, such as, you know, rhinoviruses and RSV. So hopefully as we do more studies, we'll learn more about this as well. All right, and then with that, I'll hand it back over to Dr. Jackie, who will go through questions about the flu, which is also a very important topic right now. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so on to the flu. Uh, this used to be such a big deal. Should my son get the flu shot if he has a severe egg allergy. You know, a lot of people don't know that the measles, mumps, rubella um, vaccination had the same question, and now we don't even think twice about it. And that's very much where we are with the influenza shot, which is also made out of a chick embryo. So people with a history of egg allergy of any severity should receive any licensed, recommended, and age-appropriate influenza vaccine. You don't need to wait around for that 30 minutes um, after getting the flu vaccine. But I will say, if you have a history of a severe allergic uh, reaction to egg, um, meaning something more than just hives, you should be vaccinated somewhere uh, that they, you can have some medical supervision by a healthcare provider who is familiar, certainly, with uh, managing those severe allergic conditions. People say that the hot weather kills flu and COVID. So why does it still live in Arizona, that it would go to die in Arizona? My uh, in-laws all live in Arizona. So when it gets to be 120 degrees, how is that possible that COVID is still still living then, um, or, or flu? And um, the, the simple answer is there's no easy answer because people react differently to different weather conditions. And what's really important is that you recognize your own triggers and the weather that, uh, that this may occur in. Our next question is, do you recommend schools use humidifiers to help diminish the spread of the flu and asthma? Now, this is an interesting one because there was this recent study by the U.S. National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health, and they had shown that airborne transmission of influenza is reduced if you have that humidity in the air, and that relatively relative humidity should be 40% or higher, that the airborne viruses don't survive well 
well in these environments. But here's the double-edged sword of that is certainly people that have dust mite allergy and mold allergy, those will flourish in those humid environments. So anyone with allergies um, shouldn't really be using any of those humidity uh, uh, humidifiers because it can actually make your allergy and certainly your asthma symptoms worse as a result. So not such a simple answer there. Flu season, what are we supposed to do about the holidays? And, uh, you know, even something as simple as Halloween that's coming up. Um, Halloween's followed by Thanksgiving and then all of the December and end of the year holidays. And it's a time that we so are aching to be together with family. And Dr. Fauci, who um, actually was my attending at the NIH, and I can tell you is a very family-oriented man. Um, what he's saying is you've got to stay at home. Uh, this season. So he's saying for sure um, you should be wearing masks if you and 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 try to stay aw away from large crowds. But uh, that's why you really want to be in these more intimate, lower risk uh, gatherings where you're just not having so many people around um, in your your household. So as, as he says here, understanding that everyone has this traditional, emotional, understandable, warm feeling about the holidays and bringing a group of people, friends and families together into their house indoors, which is certainly what we would need to do here in the Washington DC area and north and, um, and over to the Midwest. Um, there's very few areas where you can have your Thanksgiving outside. Um, what Dr. Fauci is really advising is we have to be so careful at this time and each individual family needs to evaluate their risk and benefit of doing that. And I have certainly heard from friends of mine that they're planning to do a pajama Thanksgiving. Um, just wake up with their own family and um, watch all kinds of great movies and, uh, and have their turkey and zoom in other family members but not really bring together other groups. Questions and more questions because we have so many questions and so one of them you'll see is about pediatric patients and do they take as long to recover from COVID as we have seen in adults and truth be told we've all seen that the hospitalization rates in children are lower and that children do tend to recover greater and hence probably faster than adults but I don't want to give you a totally false sense of security. Um, it is certainly not that uh, young children and um, high school age children and college age children um, cannot uh, contract the disease. We've all seen all sorts of sad and tragic reports of, of children dying from COVID. So um, their recovery rates are greater. It's not that, it's, that, they're, that they are immune and are not infected. When washing your hands or your mask, does the temperature of the water matter? And simply put, the CDC says no, the temperature doesn't matter for that microbe removal. But I wanna show you the next slide, which is quite interesting, where it talks about what kind of general household cleaning should be done for COVID. And I wanna to bring to you the difference in the vocabulary here. Here's what cleaning, is from a vocabulary standpoint. It refers to the removal of germs, dirt, and impurities from the surfaces, but it doesn't kill the germs. But if you think about it, if you got rid of them, well, then certainly it lowers their numbers and hence the risk of spreading them with lower numbers becomes less. But now look at what disinfecting is. Now that's using specific chemicals like EPA registered disinfectants to kill the germs. Now. Flip side is this process does not necessarily clean the dirty surfaces or remove the germs, but it does kill what's there. So if you want to really be able to put the two together, remove it by cleaning and then disinfect it and kill whatever's left. And then you've really lowered your risk of spreading infection. 
What do you do if you have somebody in your household that does become infected? And where this has really become an issue is with our kids who have returned uh, to college campuses and uh, quite a few stories of uh, one roommate gets it and the others don't. And what are you supposed to do with this? And they need to be able to quarantine in their own space. And where should they be cleaning in particular? So you want to clean and disinfect those high touch areas, particularly things like the backs of chairs and doorknobs and light switches and phones and but college kids never use landline phones so that doesn't really count um, but any sort of remote controls desks toilets sinks and that's why if you can if you can actually make them have their own quarantined area where they're in a specific room and they're away from other people and they're using their own bathroom then you're um, you have that much less to clean um, and if you can give them their own personal cleaning supplies to do it themselves that way you don't need to go in and be wiping and disinfecting and cleaning these areas now of course that's not going to be appropriate for a young child or an elderly person because you don't want people getting into trouble with using these cleaning um, uh, products um, but where you can if you can really quarantine them and have them do their own cleaning and disinfecting and have them use their own bathroom certainly and their own areas of the house it just leads to that much less cleaning that needs to be done how do you stay active because a lot of the gyms are closed or maybe some people just really aren't comfortable going back to the gym and what happens if the weather uh, doesn't cooperate some simple tips are just use fitness apps um, be creative get the whole family into a dance party um, don't over exercise a lot of people started at the beginning really thinking I, I'm going to become um, do the whole uh, exercise um, routine uh, for days and days and hours and hours um, and if you are going to be able to go outside you still got to maintain that physical distance if you do set a routine that will will certainly be a, a good thing to do where you're doing your yoga every morning at nine or you're taking a break at four or whatever it is um, have fun but not fun with eating so don't don't overeat What's the difference between the COVID test? This has been a lot in the news because uh, people are trying to get up and move around and they're often told that there's a specific test. Um, my husband actually just had uh, surgery yesterday and there are specific tests that they want you to have before you're allowed into the hospital, a specific test before you're allowed onto an airplane. Um, so what are the difference between these tests? So the PCR test, that is the one that's testing for the genetic material of the virus and they're doing it by finding a, um, they're, they're doing a particular lab technique called a polymerase chain reaction. So that's the PCR. Um, it is a molecular test and you're looking for fluid that's come from the nose, the throat swab, or from saliva. You can get the availability of the results sometimes in minutes. Um, they're very accurate when performed by a healthcare professional, um, but those really quick rapid tests can miss uh, in some cases. Then there's the antigen test. This is not looking for the genetic material. This is actually looking for the protein of the virus, so pieces of the virus itself. And you do that with a nasal or a throat swab, um, and you can also get the results in minutes. The positive test is usually accurate, but there's an increased chance of getting a false negative, meaning you're told you don't have it when in fact you do. They just didn't happen to find the piece of the virus on that particular swab. In what order are the following masks protective? Um, this seemed to be a much bigger question when we had a shortage of getting masks, um, but the N95s were always considered the best, surgical masks second. Um, we still do need to be careful, especially as we're getting into uh, the flu and cold season now with trying to save those for um, hospital settings and first responders, but certainly cotton masks, especially if you can get extra barriers in there, um, then bandanas, and lastly, neck gaiters. What do you need to know if you are a parent at home and you are in an area that your kid can go back to school? This, the CDC's put out a great document here, so just look at the boxes. Um, 
Section one is for if your child has symptoms, if they have a fever that's greater than 100.4, they have a sore throat, if they have an uncontrolled cough, especially something that causes difficulty breathing, um, and think about that for your asthmatics for sure, diarrhea, vomiting, or abdominal pain, and a new onset of headache, especially with a fever. Now, I want you to look at that section one. Truth be told, you should never have sent your kid with that, even, even before you knew about COVID. Fever, sore throat, cough, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, severe headache, especially if it was with a fever, kids shouldn't have been in school anyway. So this is just common sense. Now, what about, this is what's new though for COVID. This is what we have to look at differently than we looked at any other reason not to send our children to school, is what happens if they've had a potential exposure with uh, COVID. So how close was the contact? Within six feet of an infected person for 15 minutes, that I would keep them home because they could easily have gotten uh, infected themselves. Did they travel to or recently move from because they lived in a local tribal territorial or area where the state health department is reporting large numbers of COVID? Um, you know, if they did, if they do end up going for a family visit somewhere um, and uh, are in an area that there's a large amount of COVID, you want you don't want to send them right away to school. And then if they are in themselves living in a high community transmission um, available area, and that's only if the schools are open and, and many of those school areas are then closing down again. What about the uh, vaccine in pediatric uh, patients? Is it being tested in kids? And um, as with all vaccines, once they get through the adult ones, they'll go for the, uh, the children one. And they'll particularly be looking at pregnant women, um, and, and we're waiting for all of that. Um, currently, the um, FDA has encouraged, though, the vaccine manufacturers to consider including pregnant women in the studies. And uh, once we get that all underway, we should be able to start to look at uh, children in general. Okay, now we've got a poll question here. Yes. And Tanya will take us on from there. Thank you so much, Dr. Gari. A very good covering of so many questions. So the, the poll is pretty simple. Are some of your immediate questions being answered today? Yes, no, not sure. Or if you've got others, you can begin to put those in the question panel as well. I've opened up the poll, so go ahead and uh, cast your response. And for those of you who are casting no, I'm glad. Let's definitely go ahead and get your questions out there. So don't hesitate to put your question that has not been addressed in the control panel. We'll get to as many of those as possible in just a few moments. So we'll leave it open for just another moment or two. We've got about three fourths of people responding. Go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Looks like that for the most part, 93% say yes, we're answering a lot of the questions that you had or wanted to hear about today. 2% said no, and then 5% not sure. So for those of you who are no's or not sure's, please go ahead and put your question into the control panel and we will be getting to those additional questions here in just one moment. Uh, again, don't forget, put your questions in the box and let's go to some of those questions now. Um, let's see. Also, don't forget that you can go ahead and download your certificate of attendance at this time from the handouts pane if you wish from the GoToWebinar control panel. So first question comes up and um, is actually in regard to a patient that thinks they have a quote unquote cold. So they're coughing, sneezing, sore throat, no fever. Should we tell them to get tested for COVID? Dr. Jackie, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, yeah, the short answer is yes. Assuming that there is uh, an ease of, which gosh, I hope there is, easy availability of testing. That's what this is all about, is um, better to test because if you find out that they are infected, you can get to the business of contract 
contact tracing and um, and shut this down. And if you find out that they're not, um, you just wait for this whole thing to pass. And again, I, it's not that because you don't have COVID, you should go spread some other set of viruses and germs around, but, uh, but at least you know how far you need to contact people about. Great, thank you. All right, next question is an asthma question. Um, I have a kindergartner student whose mom has said that the face mask makes his asthma worse and wants him only to wear the face shield. His pediatrician did write a note for school saying that he doesn't have to wear a mask. Um, do you really believe that the asthma is making his symptoms worse? Should asthmatics be able to wear a mask? And then uh, a follow-up to that is the mom also told the teacher that he requires albuterol every four hours and even more on gym days. Is this appropriate? Does it sound like his asthma is well managed? So we'll turn that one to Dr. Parikh. Um, yeah, so you know, the short answer is um, no. Again, there's no good evidence that masks make it harder to breathe um, for anyone, even those with uh, chronic lung conditions like asthma and COPD. Um, so again, it could be a comfort issue and maybe that, you know, the child needs a more comfortable mask, you know, rather than not wearing one altogether because, again, a shield alone can't confer the same protection. Um, and then, yes, you know, if, if someone is needing albuterol every four hours to control their asthma, that's a pretty good sign that it's not well controlled. You know, needing it before exercise is a different story, but if you're needing it even at rest, I think, you know, he really needs to sit down um, with an asthma specialist and make sure he's on the best medications and even find, you know, a mask that might be comfortable for him, depending on the child's age. I know under two, um, we're excusing them from wearing masks. Uh, great. Thank you, Dr. Brigg. So next question is around, are there multiple strains of COVID? Um, do we, are we aware of any like mutations or reactivations? Dr. Agari, you uh, want to take that one? Uh, uh, sure, I can. Um, so multiple strains? No, there's there it seems to be just the one. Um, and reactivations, I think what they're asking is this question of can you get it twice? Um, mm -hmm. And it, it does appear that there have been certainly case reports of people who are getting it twice. Now, that brings us to what I think is also couched into this question is, I mean, they are, they are having it, uh, I wouldn't say reactivated, I would just say reinfected. And then comes the question of, so how long does your immunity last? And that may be the real reason why we're going to need to have multiple um, COVID vaccinations year over year, the way we do with influenza, is because we're ex you know, exploring as we go here, to how long does the immunity last? And a question that's going to be asked once we get the vaccine is, how long does the immunity of the vaccine last? Uh, because having the actual infection may be different in terms of the length of immunity compared to having a vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Gray. So the um, next question, oh, sorry. Oh, were you going to say something, Dr. Gray? Go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, I just wanted to add one other thing. Um, I think, you know, to Dr. Agari's point, um, there have been numerous strains identified, but we haven't seen that they make any difference in infection, you know. So right. I, I had seen a good article in Nature, you know, I think there's 13 or 14 strains identified of it, but they don't really change the clinical course, you know. So what Dr. Agari says is absolutely true, you know, we don't, have to worry that we're going to need like uh, different vaccines for each strain because right now it looks like they're all you know equally uh, infect you the same way and the clinical course is still pretty much the same but i absolutely agree time will tell how often we'll need the vaccine how long the immunity will last these are all the million dollar questions we don't know yeah and and this is a great follow-up to that question dr preek so do you believe that the vaccine will prevent or protect patients from getting covid or do you think it could just simply minimize symptoms, similar to sometimes what we hear about the flu vaccine? Right. You know, so there's no, you know, 100% guarantee with anything. And even just to get it approved, the FDA is requiring for it to be 50% effective, 5-0. So that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad vaccine because the idea is we want to reduce the transmission. We want to reduce the infectivity like we are able to with the flu vaccine. 
And we also want to make it so that even if you do get sick, you're not going to end up in the hospital or, or worse, you know, being one of the casualties of COVID-19. So yes, I mean, some people are maybe lucky that it prevents them from getting sick altogether. But even if it makes you less sick than you would have been, I think that's still a huge win, especially with this pandemic. Absolutely. And I think just to follow up on that, the only way that we're really going to be able to have a handle on those numbers is to be able to go through large vaccination uh, periods and then compare it to, as Dr. Parikh says, what's your outcome? Because remember, there are people, a lot of people, who will get COVID and they will get sick, but mildly sick. Then we know there are certainly people who are asymptomatic when they get it. And having a vaccine is not going to be as impressive in them. Uh, so what we'll want to see overall, once we get the vaccinations out there, is the, the real morbidity and mortality, the real uh, problems that we've seen with COVID hospitalizations and deaths. You'll want to see that go down. Yeah. So this next question comes from Carolyn and says, I heard the flu was actually milder in Australia this year, possibly due to mask wearing and social distancing. What are your thoughts about how this could reflect in the US? I agree. My, my again, mentor, Dr. Fauci would say exactly the same thing. And as I explained when we were looking at the, what does the CDC say about sending a child to school with COVID symptoms? It should have been, what does the CDC say about sending a child to school with any kind of infectious symptoms? Is now I think we're just really becoming uh, more aware as a community altogether of infection control. That's, that's, we've all learned it together on a, on a mass scale. Wash your hands, cover your cough, cough into your elbow. Um, don't spread the germs around. And so one would hope that that would be whatever the virus um, or bacterial infection would be. Great. So really interesting question next from Julia. She says that her school system is buying air purifiers for the health room, the health office. Do you believe they're effective? And is there any particular qualities that you should look for in purchasing an air purifier? And then I'll add on to that because we've heard this question a good bit about the UV lights and the effectiveness of UV lights in killing the virus. So um, Dr. Creek, you wanna address that? Um, yeah, so the air purifiers is an interesting one and I looked into it and it, it comes down to the particle size. So for yes, some of the bigger droplets of COVID-19 or bigger particles, absolutely, the, if the filter such as a HEPA air purifier like we use for allergens can filter it, then by all means. But the problem comes that, you know, there are much smaller droplets that may not be filtered out. So again, it's not meant to have a false sense of security. And the same even goes for allergens. You know, there's some allergens where the HEPA purifier can't purify them. Um, and as for the UV light, you know, I know that the data was mixed on it. I do think it reduces it on surfaces, but again, it's not 100%. I don't know if Dr. Jackie knows that data better, but again, I wouldn't take any of these as like a let your guard down uh, type of scenario. Yeah, and that sort of brought us to, to one of the questions that I had covered about, you, you know, there's always that double-edged sword, like the, the question we covered in terms of humidifiers is increasing humidifier humidity seems to be able to decrease the ability for the virus to survive, but it's no free lunch. You end up with having an increase of, of dust mite and mold allergy. So we're figuring it out with some of this stuff. Great. So our next question comes from Kate and she says, um, what are your thoughts about what's called the COVID long haul syndrome or where we're having students post COVID that are actually required to be homebound because they're just simply too weak or unwell to do the regular classwork? Yeah, and I think that's happening in adults as well. Um, you know, there's all kinds of reports and uh, with, with adults, for instance, having cardiac difficulties. Um, we're yet to see uh, what's going to happen with respiratory problems uh, long haul as well. And, you know, the only thing I can say is, is that when I went to medical school, we thought everything was done. We thought we had discovered everything. And as a result, we knew what the long haul from even things like tuberculosis, things that I didn't really see in an active state, but I certainly saw patients that had contracted tuberculosis 
40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and so I knew all of what that could be. This is all brand new and you're just seeing it un unravel in real time. Yeah, absolutely. So this next question definitely comes from the school setting and says, you know, spacer versus no spacer in the school setting with COVID, does it help to decrease the possibility of the spread of COVID uh, compared to not using a spacer? And uh, any thoughts around how uh, school nurses might help unlicensed or untrained staff um, you know, calm their fears about students using inhalers in the classroom? The first thing before Dr. Parikh jumps in and answers that in her beautiful way, my first question would be, why are we doing this in school? That's always the question. I just want to make sure that we're not like administering lot maintenance medicine in school that could and should be administered at home and albuterol on an as needed basis that really is simply showing that their asthma is out of control. Yeah, good point. But as to if they have to, Dr. Parikh will tell you, <laughs> what happens if they have to? <laughs> Dr. Preet just lost power, so she's going to be dialing back in. We'll let her um, answer that okay. in just a minute. Um, but then the other question is around nebulizer use, and I know we've had this question time and time again throughout the pandemic, but um, should nebulizers be used and um, in, the, in the school setting, in the home setting? If so, does it increase the risk for the spread of COVID? Yes, and, and the difficulty is that you're putting droplets out there. And uh, I think to get back to the question about the spacers is spacers would certainly be better than nebulizers um, because it's more of a closed system. And in terms of delivery, if you can get that spacer that is, I'd say really anybody who's from the age of two up is not to have the face mask kind of a spacer where the medication just sprays all over their face, but rather it does go right into their mouth where they can inhale. And even a two-year-old can learn how to coordinate, breathe in psh, when I puff. Um, it's always difficult when you see a six-year-old uh, using a spacer that covers their whole face with a mask. Um, mm -hmm. I'd much prefer them put that one in their mouth. And that if you've got, uh, Really, some would say a five or six year old on up, can you get them to take their medication uh, without um, a spacer at all and uh, allow them just to, especially if they've got something that is an auto -haler. that does also oftentimes make it a little easier. So this is a really good question that comes from Lisa and she says, you know, she's a high school school nurse and would like to hear your expert opinions about the risk of sports, things like cheerleading, volleyball, wrestling, um, you know, uh, throughout the country, there is a variety of different approaches to high school sports this fall. So what are your thoughts? I'm assuming Dr. Parikh isn't back yet because I don't want to take all of her opportunities. No, okay. I don't, go ahead. Okay, so I would say, um, you know, what have we seen uh, the grown-ups do? What have we seen professional sports do? We've seen those that can operate in a bubble um, and they just keep down contact uh, with the outside world and they shout and they jump and they, they dribble and they run and they huff and they puff, um, but they're all in this bubble. Uh, but uh, high school sports aren't going to work that way because you're not moving an entire set of rival high school teams to go live together in Disney World. It would be interesting though, how we might spread love and affection throughout those <laughs> high school teams. But um, but when you're talking about things like cheerleading and uh, and any kind of I any kind of sports where they're huffing and puffing and breathing and close contact, um, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I have certainly seen some very creative ways. We've talked about in one of the questions that I handled was how do you do exercise when the gym is closed and to be creative. And um, I've even seen uh, ballet dancers. They are, you know, that's an interesting group of people. If you think about all of our entertainers um, with Broadway, certainly in New York and, and all the ballets uh, closed, professional ballets closed down. I've seen uh, a ballet company actually do an entire ballet that was uh, socially distant and done on Zoom. 
and uh, we've seen all kinds of concerts done that way for sure um, you know with the French hornist and the bassoonist and they're blowing all kinds of air around and they, and they do it socially distanced and then they they do it virtually okay so definitely if we're doing sports make sure it's outside try to social distance wear masks where appropriate um, if you know again I think that it's hard when the district is you as a school nurse is saying this probably isn't the best idea and the district is saying no we're going to play our football games or or we're going to have our sporting events so um just take this yes. you know appropriate steps as, as you can now the next question i think dr preek is back I'll, I'll give this one to her why is it that the cdc uh recommends that 14-day quarantine period and upon that if a child is exposed but not symptomatic, how long should they stay out of school or stay at home? Um, yeah, so that time frame is recommended because it can take three to 14 days to show symptoms, you know? So that's really the longest time frame that you can go without assuming, you know, you've been uh, uh, infected. And uh, for a child, I would also recommend the same time frame and also negative tests if possible. Great, and and so if you are, if you do have COVID, um, and you come down with symptoms or are asymptomatic, you're saying 14 days from that onset of symptoms before you should safely return. Yes, right? absolutely. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, let's see. How are children who are IgA or IgG deficient faring with COVID-19? Have you seen any data on that? I'll let Dr. Uh, Parikh take that one. So, I mean, so far from what we've seen from the IDS, Immune Deficiency Foundation, they're collecting data, but the good news is they haven't seen that that group is any worse. Oh. Good, great. All right, this comes in regard to testing and have we, what are the rates of false positives on the different tests? And on the blood test specifically, how long do the antigens stay in the blood? I can um, answer that's a piece I'll on go the, for it. go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 I was just saying that, you know, the false positive data, at least from my understanding, isn't great, but I know the false negatives can be up to 30%, even on the PCR test. Um, as long as how long it lasts in the blood, I know that's been variable. I don't know, Dr. Jaffe, if you have more insight on Well, the only thing I would say about the blood test, how long it lasts in the blood is, one simple thing is just to know which test you're looking at right there's IgM and IgG and the way I always remembered that was the antibody called IgM is like the Marines they're the first ones to hit the beach right they're the first ones to show up in a conflict they're not meant to last forever they're they're meant to be there while there's an acute infection they're meant to be the head of the spear in terms of those antibodies then the IgGs are the ones that you're always looking for those should be persistence but what we have seen especially in people who have gotten reinfected is we know that they had the infection they had a positive test result they they formed antibodies and then they waned because somehow they got it again and and that's the thing that we're going to need to try to keep track of in order to know how often we're going to need to immunize so one time for one quick question le left, and that is from Lori. We didn't get to everyone's, but hopefully we got to yours and to most of them today. Are dry or wet coughs more common with COVID? That's a great question. I, from what I've read, dry, but both for sure are possible because as you know, there are secondary pneumonias that come from it. That's what I was going to say too. It can be both. Uh, we've heard of reports of both, um, but certainly if you have that productive cough, a wet cough um, with mucus, then the risk of pneumonia is higher. Great. Thank you. But both. it often Thank starts you. with just that dry cough is, is yeah. often the first sign. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Creek. Thank you, Dr. Agari, for your time today. And thanks to each of you for offering all of these different questions. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed listening as we looked at COVID-19 and worked to get all of the answers to your questions. Please do consider joining us for the next webinar in our COVID-19 series when we look at vaccines, social guidance, and asthma a global glance at COVID-19, where we'll look at the US versus other countries. And this webinar will be on November 12th at 3 p.m. Eastern. 
Um, and this again is the 16th in our series. You can register on our webinar page under news. And once again, thank you all for joining us. This is Tanya Winders on behalf of the Allergy Asthma Network staff. And we want you to know that the network is here working hard every day to help you get the information you need, the answers to your questions, so that we can all breathe better together. Thank you and have a great day.